I just want to share this morning about what really makes my life tick. And if you can understand this truth, you need nothing else. This morning I want to talk about and not just talk about, but I want the presence of the Lord to be with you always. You know, there are many people trying to get something to happen. We try to do this and do this to show somebody that God is here. I tell you, when you are in the presence of God, you don't have to prove anything to anybody. They know it. I have been around this world where the presence of God is so great, I've got up to preach and couldn't preach. The, just the weeping would drown out my preaching and just have to stop. I did that a while back. I got up to preach and the people, the presence of God was so great. The people just were weeping. And I said, I know there's 120 here God's called as full-time preachers. And they ran to the front. And when we counted them, there was exactly 120 at Medang, Papua, New Guinea. The presence of God. I know that there's a lot of emphasis on groups. There's a lot of emphasis on the body. There's a lot of emphasis on having a whole church together. But when you read the Word of God, you see that God dealt with one man. God dealt with Abraham. God spoke to one man. The prophet got his message from God. God spoke to Joseph. God spoke to a man, Moses. All of Israel didn't see the burning bush, but God's man saw the burning bush. God spoke to Samuel. A call in his bed. God spoke to one man. God spoke to David, God spoke to his prophets. John the Baptist, one man wandering in the wilderness. Jesus, one man alone for 40 days. Paul, alone with God in the desert for three years. John on the Isle of Patmos, alone in prison on an island. Hear God. The presence of God. And today I want to share with you about the presence of God. Not only you preachers, but everybody in this building. And I tell you, so many of us have been trying to get over here because we hear God's there and we flood over there. And others say he's over here and we run there. I want to share with you today, you can have the presence of God all the time, anywhere, because his presence will be with you. I tell you, I can be in the deadest church in the world. And if they read a scripture verse, I have glory because God is with me. It doesn't matter whether everybody else is dead or alive. I'm alive. God's with me. And if you start living in the presence of God, the glory of God will be so with you. Others will want to join in. You don't have to go hunting for the presence. You need to live in the presence of God. And when you start living in the presence of God, people will be drawn. Don't worry about gimmicks or gadgets. You can't keep them out of your building if God is there. In 1979, on the Amazon, in the Iquitos, Peru, where I had, after two years of walking with a cross, 
from Mexico to South America. God said, Make, get a boat and put the cross on the front of the boat and sail down the Amazon and go into every village and carry the cross in. Go back on the boat and go to the next village and then go across the river and carry the cross in. One night I was praying and talking. My daughter Jenna was with me and another friend, Mike Uton. And as we were reading in the Word of God, studying in Samuel, I never will forget reading these words. And I will raise me up a faithful priest that will do according to that which is in my heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. Here was one man, Eli, who had failed, but God was raising him up another man. I tell you, God is at work. You don't have to promote God. He will cause the stones to preach if nobody else will. Don't worry about it. I live around the world. If you white preachers and white Christians won't go, God will fill the world with Chinese preachers or black preachers or red preachers. I'm not worried about what God wants to do on this earth. He's going to do it. My Bible says, my Bible says as God spoke, as surely as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. My God said it. I believe it. I'm not worried about it. What's the matter of concern for you is whether you're going to let God use you or not. But if you don't let him use you, there's 10,000 more ready to go. It's up to you if you want to move with God or not. As I read that scripture, my heart was pierced. I will raise me up a faithful priest that will do what is in my heart and in my mind. You know, God loves to be with us. In the Garden of Eden every day, God came walking and talking and visiting with them. God loved Adam. He loved Eve. Every day he spent time with them. You don't have to beg God to communicate with you. That's what he's been doing from the beginning. If anybody's an extrovert and wants to be known, it's God. He wants everybody to know him. He's not hiding secrets. He wants you to know every secret he's got. If it's a secret, it's because we don't talk to him. He's not hiding from you. And as I read that, and I lay down in bed, I said, oh God, I know how you visited with Adam. And you walked and talked, and when he sinned, you went searching after him. Why? Where art thou? I said, Lord, if you're... If you just got a, if you just want to visit with somebody tonight, you can visit with me. If you got anything on your mind you want to talk about, share it with me. I don't know about your relationship with God, but my relationship is He's the best friend I've ever had. I know Him better than I know my wife. I know Him better than I know my kids. I love to live with him. I just, he's my friend. And, and I just, I just, I, that's all I know. And I want to talk to you today about living in the glorious presence of the Lord. In Exodus 34, I mean 33, the Bible says, And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle. A cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked to Moses. Now let me share with you this. I could talk to you today about me going around the world. I'd love to many times I do. I could share about 28 times in jail about this cross being beaten. You ought to, I can tell you stories of every one of those marks and bumps and patches and everything else on that cross. I've seen it covered with spit. I've seen people throwing it down and breaking it. I've been beaten and stone taken out before a firing squad to be shot 
and the glory of God put all the gunmen on the ground in Nicaragua. I could give you the details of everything, but if I told you about me, that'd be one thing. But what I want to do today is tell you how you can live it all yourself. How you can leave this place and live in the presence of the Lord forever. And you'll have your own stories. You don't have to worry about getting thrilled over mine. You'll live them out. I get so tired. Sometimes it's very difficult to be around Christians. And I get somewhere and they'll say, tell me this story. Why I heard this and I'm like a tourist bureau. I want to talk about Jesus. I'm not interested in what I've done. I'm interested in what God's doing. He's with me. And that's enough. That's why I go on and on and on and on. It's enough. I don't need anything else. I don't need a crowd. I don't need a cheer. I don't need appeasement. I don't need anything else. I'm not worried about getting worked up and coming down. I'm living with Jesus. I'm living in the presence of God 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Most of the time I have to nearly backslide to get low enough to go to sleep at night. I've got to, I want to go. People say, if you don't slow down, you're going to burn out. I'd rather burn out than rust out. I'd rather go out with a mm, than eke out with arthritis and rheumatism. I know who I'm living with. And it really doesn't matter to me where. People say, Arthur, aren't you scared when you go over to Beirut? Aren't you afraid I'll soon be going to Chad? I'll, I know all these places. I say, hey, man, the same God's with me all the time. It doesn't matter where we are. It's who you're living with. And in the presence of God, God does everything. And let me tell you one little thing. We get so excited about some miracle. I could tell you miracles I've seen with my eyes that you couldn't believe. I never even talk about it. It happened over somewhere else. It happened for the glory of what happened then for those people. And it's not my business to run around trying to convince every guy a body that God's doing something. I know what he's doing. I'm not worried about it. And I don't have to prove it. God takes care of his own proof. When he's around, you don't have to prove him. The people know God's there. That's enough. Let's just look at it. I'm about ready to preach, but this message, the thing about it, is we hadn't even got started yet. Moses was up on the mountain. God told him to do something. God took one man up there. He didn't take everybody. Called one man to go up there. And the people down saw glory happening. But what happened down there? Moses entered into the tabernacle and the cloud descended and the Lord talked with Moses. And the people saw the cloudy pillar at the tabernacle door and all the people rose up and worshiped every man in his tent, and the Lord spoke to Moses face to face. Tell you, I get so tired, I come back here in this country, and people, Christians, nearly wear me out. They're saying, do you have a word from the Lord for me? I say, yes, study the Word of God and pray. We've got the cheapest kind of religion today. We don't want to fast and pray. We want to run up to James Robinson and say, James, where am I supposed to go? And he tells you and you just run off and it gets tough and you quit. He must have been wrong. No, you were wrong. Get your orders from God. Talk to God. There's no cheap way to communicate with God. We run to the altar, think five quick minutes. I tell you one time I fasted 28 days with just water another time, 40 days. I tell you, you've got to be with God. You hunger and thirst for Him. Be with Him. God will speak to you. You don't have to get secondhand callings, trivial, fleecy looking stuff. God never said the just shall live by fleece or by confirmation. He said they'll live by faith. By faith. And we come up with these little cheap games. Lord speaks to us and says, Get to New York. You say, well, if you want me to go to New York, you get a ticket here tomorrow morning and have somebody deliver it by 10 a.m. and I'll go. Who are you to make a game out of God's voice? 
If God tells you to get to New York, you better get to New York. Get out there on the next plane and go. If you hadn't got enough money for a ticket, drive. If no, if you don't have gas money or a car, hitchhike. If no, if you and nobody will pick you up, walk. I walked across America from here to New York. You can make it in three months. And if you can't walk, get down there and crawl. Some guy went to Washington crawling. Took him a few years. If you can't crawl, say somebody, where's New York? That way. And just fall. But go. Hear God and go. If I went in this world because there was open doors, I'd still be in L.A. If there's a door in your way, tear it down. Don't stand there looking for an open one. Go. God spoke to Moses. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. And if you don't hear God, something's wrong. The Lord spoke to him face to face as a man speaketh to his friend. Are you a friend of God? And the Moses, God started speaking. If you had just a moment to talk with God, now we do, his presence is here, all that, but if you had one moment to talk with God, what would you say? We have 30 seconds. Yeah, and God's looking at nobody else on the whole planet, let's imagine, you and him face to face, what would you say? Oh, you'd say, give me this, oh, Lord, I need that, whatever else. I tell you, here's what Moses said. Exodus 33, 13. Now, therefore, I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me thy way that I may know you, that I may find grace in thy sight and consider that this people that these, this nation is thy people. Now in a moment we're going to show you what God said and how the glory came. But we got to look at the man's heart first, right? Amen. We say, Lord, show me my, thy glory. Glorify yourself in my church. Glorify yourself in my life. We are looking for the glory. Moses was looking to know the way of God. Show me thy way. His first statement. Let me tell you this. As I've walked around with the world with this cross, if you're on the wrong way, <laughs> you're not going to get there. Most important thing is to be in the right way. Be where God told you. Moses said, Lord, I want to know your way. There's this way, that way, that way, that way, every way. Everybody's got some idea which way is yours, Lord. His word shows us and his spirit. Show me, if you get your life lined up with God, everything else is okay. And let me tell you this. If you're in the way of God and anything happens, if anything happens, it's okay. Because you're in God's way. In God's way, one time Paul, God's spirit, God came and opened the, the door of the jail, right? He later on, God let him die. Why, God saved Daniel from the lion's den, but he let Stephen get stoned to death. Just live in the way of God and everything's okay. Whether you live or you die. If you're in God's way. Moses said, show me your way. Second, he said, I want to know you. <laughs> I don't know how to describe that. Maybe I put it better this way. I was invited to be with Pope John Paul II to celebrate 10 years of carrying the cross around the world. And I went to Rome. They invited me to carry the cross through Rome and into the Vatican. <laughs> and I met with the Pope and shared with him for eight minutes. And I remember at the end I said, is there anything I can do for you? He said, what? 
I said, is there anything I can do for you? He looked at me. He put his arm around my neck. He said, everybody's wanting something from me. You're the only person I think I ever met that just said, can I do something for you? You didn't want anything from me. I said, is there? I asked him the third time. He said, yes, go to Assisi. Pray for me on the way to Assisi and go to Poland. Go to my people in Poland. Well, I, there was a priest named Father Maloney in Glacia Santa Susanna in Rome. And he was the one who was kind of, he's American, and he was the one I kind of was with and was interpreting when I was in the streets and, and everything. And I'd been with him about four days. And I left to go to Assisi in the sleet and snowy rain mixed in some snow on the ground. It was cold, and I just had the clothes on my back. Already when I got to the church, I was wet and cold. Said goodbye to Father Maloney. And all the time I was with him, I'd say, hey, man, I love you. And we'd I'd pray, and, and uh, he'd interpret when I was on the streets and things, and he never said, I love you. Just, I'd say, I love you, and he'd, you know, he'd just grin and everything, and after four days, you begin to wonder, you know, uh, and I said goodbye to him, and I said, I love you, I really do, I thank you for just being with you, and I turned, picked up the cross, started to step away, and he said, Arthur, and I looked back, he looked at me, I'll never forget, he said, I like you. I said, about time I heard something. I said, never, I told you I loved you a thousand times. You never said a word. Didn't seem to faze him. He said, I really like you. He said, I'm commanded by Christ to love everybody. He said, I love everybody, but I don't like everybody. He said, I don't like the way some people talk. I don't like the way some people live. I don't like the actions of many people cursing God, not believing. I love them, but I don't like. But he said, I like you. I like to eat with you, he said. I like walking down the street with you. He said, I even like interpreting your preaching. And he said, I like the way you pray. I never write them in a book. Just pray them out of your heart. He said, I like being around you. He said, I like you, and I love you. Let me ask you this. Do you love God? But do you like him? Do you like Jesus? Do you like his word? Then why aren't you reading it? I tell you, if you like it, they can't get it out of your hands. Do you like him? Do you like the way Jesus lives? Then you'd live that way. Do you like what he said? Do you like him? There's meeting and there's knowing. Haven't you met many people you'd like to know? You met someone, but then you want to know. If you know someone, if I know you, James, I can say somebody said many years ago, have you ever met James Robinson? I said, yes. They said, what do you think about him? I said, well, I, I know he loves the Lord. I really don't know him. Everything I know I like, but I don't, I've never really got to know him. But I tell you now, somebody said, do you know James Robinson? I can say, yes, I know him. I mean, we've cried our souls out together. I, I believe I know the way he thinks. I believe I know the way he feels but I want to know more. Let me ask you this. Do you know God? Do you know what God's thinking about? Do you know what God likes? Do you know what the desire of God is? Do you know him? Do you like him? Moses said, show me your way. I want to know you. That's been the pursuit of my life, to know him. I'm just way back, just touched the hem of his garment, but I'm, I'm clawing my way up. I, 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 I want to know everything there is to know about God. 
I want to know him. Third thing he said was that I may find grace in thy sight. Every one of us need mercy, don't we? Lord, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. I don't deserve anything in my estimation, but I know in your mind you think I deserve it. Let me tell you, God thinks you're of a lot of value. So much he gave the greatest thing he ever had, Jesus. Don't ever say you're not worth anything. You're worth Calvary. Jesus didn't die, die in vain. He didn't die for a bunch of junk. He died for his creation who's dying and being destroyed. And he loves you and wants to redeem you. You're worth Jesus Christ. But he said, Lord, have mercy. I failed, right? I hadn't lived that way. Then the fourth thing he said was consider that this nation is thy people. I had a confidential meeting with, with the key leaders of the U.S. Senate. I won't talk about it any more than that because I can't, because I never exploit these kind of things. But in our meeting together, I shared with them this scripture where Moses said, consider that this nation is thy people. I said, if you guys try to solve America's problems, the weight of it will crush you. It's God's nation. He'll take care of it. You just get in the way of God. Let me tell you, preachers, if you try to straighten out every mess in this church, you're going to die of frustration, nervous breakdowns, and all kind of confusion. It's God's church. Consider that these people are my people. Moses didn't say they're mine. He said they're yours. They're out in the middle of the Sinai Desert. I walked across it from Jerusalem to Cairo and to have hundreds of thousands of people out there, you've got a mess. He could have listed off a million problems, but he summed it up in one-fourth of a sentence. It's your problem. You get in the way of God and he'll take care of everything else. You serve him. Follow him. And then, you know, the Lord said, my presence shall go with thee and I will give you rest. Isn't that fun? <laughs> hey Moses, don't worry about it. You're in this big desert, but I will go with you. You know what that word presence there, the root of it means in Hebrew, my face shall go before you. My face will be, in, will be with you. I'm looking after you. I will be with you. And when you've got his presence, you don't need anything else. That's all. Amen? Amen. Now, we, we're just starting off. Now, it's going to get better. Hang on. You can't miss a point or you're going to lose it at the end. My presence will go with you, and I'll give you rest. Don't worry about it, James. Just go. Preach the word. Live for Jesus. Have fun. It's not a sin to smile. There's nothing wrong with being happy because God is with you. My presence shall be with you and give you rest. Then you know what Moses did? He did like a lot of us. Just so sweet, isn't it? So good, you know what Moses said? He said in verse 18, I ask you, Lord, show me your glory. A little mortal man saying, Lord, show me your glory. Have you ever asked the Lord for that? Sure you have. But most of us didn't have it all lined up at the beginning, right? Being in his way, wanting to know him, having mercy and saying, Lord, it's all your problem. And you know what the Lord answered? He said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. He didn't even hesitate in the next verse he got it. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? It didn't take ten verses or a chapter or hours. Right then God said, you got it. You asked for it, you got it. Why? Because his heart was in the way of God. He wanted to know God. His motives were right. 
He wasn't looking for a little miracle to hold out and say, see, God's with me. I can prove it. He had the right motive. I'm with you. I love you, God. See, God's the one just pouring out all of his blessing. The Lord said, I'll make all my goodness pass before you, and I'll proclaim the, <laughs> the name of the Lord before you, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou can't, you can't see my face, for you can't see me and live. The Lord knew how much he could stand. But he said, I'll give you to, take you to the limit, right? I mean, the very out, the last bit you can take, I'll give you. He's not going to give you any more than you can stand. You can't see my face and live. If he gave you everything, you'd be dead, Moses. You'll get that later. But I will, there's a place by me. Hallelujah. Preacher, don't you want to be in that place? There's a place by me. James, you can be by him. You can't get around and get in his face, but you can be by him. And he said, there's a little place by me, and I'm going to have you stand on a rock. Isn't that good? On a rock. He didn't, they were on a high mountain, you know, they're in, in solid ground. And he said, I'll make it come to pass. My glory shall pass by, and I will put you in a cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand while I pass by. And I'll take away my hand, and you'll see my back part, but my face shall not be seen. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, Moses, you got the right motive. Your heart's desire is right. I'll make all my goodness pass before you, and I'll stand you right by me. And don't worry about it from now on. My presence and my face shall be with you. And you don't worry about anything from then on. That's all I know is how I've lived. I said, Lord, it's your problem, not mine. Went to Beirut, me and Joshua. How can I take care of me and Joshua in Beirut, Lebanon, during the siege? Israelis, PLO, Syrians, Druze, Phalanxes, everybody shelling. Lord, we live, we live, we die, we die. I never expected anything out of God. I feel like Paul having food and rain when I'm content. I don't need anything else. Don't even need, I got a nice hotel room. Thank you. But I'd have slept. I've got two sleeping bags right here with me. I'd sleep right here on the floor. Doesn't matter. He's with me. And it's glorious wherever it is. God said, I'll let my glory pass before you. And God did. Now, it wasn't just one experience. Turn over to the last chapter of Exodus. Now we're getting down. It just gets better and better. And then in verse 34, And a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Remember God made him have, make a tabernacle. And place in there is represented his presence. The Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the glory abode thereon, and the glory of God filled the tabernacle. And the cloud was taken up over the tabernacle, and the children of Israel went onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, they journeyed not till the day when it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and the fire was on it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel through all their journeys. The cloud throughout the Bible has represented the presence of God. The fire has represented the presence of God. Remember when Abraham had that vision that God gave him and it was dark in Genesis 15 and it came to pass that the sun went down and it was dark and behold a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between the pieces. He saw the smoke, the cloud and the fire all the way through the word of God. Here we get the picture. Now stay with me. In the New Testament, what is the tabernacle and the temple? Where? Our body. Right? 
now where is the temple where is the tabernacle now you hear me there was cloud over it by day and fire by night when the cloud moved they moved when the cloud stopped they stopped it representing right in the book of Acts the Holy Spirit the presence of God when the Holy Spirit came as cloven tongues of fire they lived under the cloud by day and under the fire at night I tell you today in Dallas Texas God wants you to live today in this tabernacle of the presence of God now under the cloud and in the fire day by day by day and when he moves you move and when he stops you stop but you always have the presence in all the journey so you never have to be depressed like you could be depressed about surrounded by the fire and the glory God said I'll make my face go before you and he said surely in mercy shall follow you all the days of your life man I start going down the road and things look tough I say Lord your face is before me hey goodness hello mercy hallelujah I'm not alone the Holy Spirit's there the presence of God is there he is with me his presence I'll move on fastly second Chronicles 7 verse 1 and when Solomon had made an end of praying the fire came down from heaven hallelujah that's the same kind of praying they did in Acts James they'd pray they got somewhere they were in touch with somebody and that somebody's God fire came down from heaven and consumed their offerings and sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the house you know what God wants to do with that tabernacle you got? He wants to put his fire on you and fill your tabernacle with his glory. And the priests could not enter into the house of the Lord. You know, you read over and over in the Word of God where the glory of God's so strong, people can't, they can't hardly move. They can't get in. The glory of God's there. I tell you, I'd, I'd rather have the glory of God resting on me than the biggest sign in the world or the biggest building in the world are all the money in the world and all these religious agencies try to sign me up with them I've had every one of them who've offered me to be my representative my agent everything all I am is me and my wife and six kids and I got one lady comes in one day a week and opens the mail and that's it now I'm not saying everybody's got to operate that way you got to have a staff you're gonna be on TV and everything else I'm just telling you though the way I live and here's all they come in and they say author we've got the uh, brochures everything show me how I can have a wooden cross to give somebody that gives fifty dollars little silver one for one that gives five hundred and a gold one for a thousand dollars wheel and all and I say the God I serve doesn't need gimmicks and gadgets and trinks I'm living in the glory I'm living in the glory and they say but author if you had more money you could do more I say no they say what I said I you can't do more with more money not by might nor by power but by my spirit you can do more in the Holy Spirit flat broke than you can do with 50 million dollars and then they ask you the other question they say author you're trying to reach people and we can help you you want to preach to more people right the more people you preach to the better I say no I say what I said I'm only interested in doing the will of God if we're trying to if I'm running after people to get more people saved in that sense I made an idol of people instead of God's will I tell you I don't care how many people you preach to 
But if God tells you to go down the middle of the Amazon and learn the language and reach 500 people in that little tribe for Jesus, that guy down there spending two or three years learning the language and everything else, he might be the greatest thing on TV. God told him go down there and you better obey God. And then if God tells you to do something in the whole world and you preach to millions on TV, that's okay. But you're not any better than the guy down in the jungle. All you're doing is doing the will of God. It didn't matter where, when, or what. People say to me, oh boy, the Lord's really using you now. I remember when you used to just be going around preaching in little churches. I say, hey, I, I, it's the same God. I'm doing the same thing. It has nothing to do with it. I just want to be where God wants me. And the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord filled the house. And they bowed themselves on their face to the ground and worshiped, praising the Lord, saying, He is good and His mercy endureth forever. I tell you, Solomon got in there with the glory of God. God's glory came down and everybody knew God was there because His glory was there and they fell on the floor. Brother pastors, if you go home with the glory, you don't have to tell them how great the conference was. All you got to go home is walk in that pulpit and look at them and they'll know whether it was worth it or not. Do you hear me? You can say all this and all that and all this and we heard this and we saw that. That didn't mean a thing to them. They've heard it all. You get up there with God and they'll know it. Because God wasn't just at the conference. God's were you in the morning. We're not going to make a God out of this conference. It's God. It's God. What's, matter, what's valuable in this is that you be changed to have that life every day. If this is the highlight of your year, you're going to have a bad year. It ought to get better all the time, right? Am I right? You ought to, by December, you ought to say, man, that, that Bible conference was a drag down there. I'm so much further along. I thought I was excited. I don't need a hang. I never wipe. I just let it drop. I don't know. I usually preach in the jungles, and I got dirt and everything else all over me. I'm not interested in the water. I'm interested in the blood. Amen. <laughs> Second Corinthians 3, 17. You think that's good? Hang on, it's getting better. We had not even got to the main point yet. Now the Lord is that spirit. How many of you say Jesus is my Lord? Just and I'm not trying to play a game, but raise your hands now. Come on. If he is, okay. Now, how many of you say the Holy Spirit is in you? Raise your hand. Now, all the Bible declares is this. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Some of us keep trying to find it. He said it's where it is. People say, I'm trying to get free. I just read it like it said. Right out of King James, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You don't have to try to get it. You've already got liberty in the Spirit. So just start living the way God's Spirit wants you to. Brother, I believe when you're saved, you get everything you need, but most of us mess it all up, and we have to have the Lord give us more. And we have to get more and more and more. Well, that's right. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Liberty to do what? Look at it. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, what? The glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image. From glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You ever looked in a mirror, standing in front of it, what do you see? Yourself. You ever stood in front of a mirror, kind of at an angle, and saw somebody else? Yes. Now, the Word of God says 
It's like we are looking in the mirror with an open We're looking straight into the mirror. But as we look into the mirror, we see the glory of the Lord. And you stand in front looking at the glory of the Lord. And what happens? You are then changed into the same image that you're looking at. When you are with God, you begin to look like Him. Have you ever seen old people? Doesn't matter whether one's short or one tall. It seems like if they've been married 50 years, not many will ever make it now. They're getting divorced so many times. But if you've been with somebody, they look alike. Have you ever noticed that? Just they start, they, they've been in the flow so long. My dear friend, the way to look like Jesus is to be with Jesus. Amen. How do you do that? By the Spirit. We are changed by the Spirit. From glory to glory. See, that's what I was talking about. We ought to be more at the end of the year than we are now. It's not from glory to the pits and then back up to a glory. We've led people in so many high religious experiences till they're, they're tired of our invitations. They're afraid of getting worked up on Sunday because they know they can't live it on Monday. I don't believe in that either. I believe in being all the time in the presence of God and you're never down. Amen. My friend, God never intended for you to be down. He did not never intend for you to get down again and you don't have to be. People say, Arthur, have you ever felt like just giving up and quitting? Let me tell you, I feel like the chiefest of sinners. And those who prayed with me know my heart. Man, I, I know my sins, but I tell you, I've never felt like quitting preaching. I've never felt like saying, oh, it's a bad day, I'll just blow my brains out. I have never felt depressed. You can ask my wife, my kids, I guarantee you, I mean sometimes I am disappointed but I'm not depressed and not discouraged because God knows who's with me. And that's enough. You can go from glory to glory. And then he said, even by the Spirit. Now quickly, got water all over my Bible, can't hardly read it now. Verse 6 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. For God who commanded Hear this, the light to shine out of darkness has shined where? In our hearts. Now hear me, preachers. Get a hold of this. The God who created, he, that's why he said, called the light shine out of darkness. Remember in the beginning, God had the darkness and the light. First it was darkness and then he made the light. He's saying that same God who began it all, Right now, the same God who caused the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our heart to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Where do you get the glory? By being changed by the Spirit by looking into the mirror, by seeing the mirror of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is the glory. Jesus makes you glorious. And he causes the glory to be in the heart, right? How? In the face of Jesus. I'll just read a few verses. For we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. And let me tell you, when you're living in the presence of God, this is what happens. We are troubled on every side, but not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus may be manifest in our body. 
For we have the same spirit of faith which is written, I have believed and I have spoken. We have believed and we have spoken. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up also our bodies. In verse 16, For they for which cause we faint not, but though the inward, but though our outward man may perish, our inward man is renewed day by day. For the light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a greater and more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. For we look not at the things which are seen, but at those things which are not seen. For those things which are seen are temporal, but those things which are not seen are eternal. My friend, I can't promise you preachers you'll never be persecuted. Jesus said, Blessed art thou when you're persecuted for my name's sake. I can't ever say you'll never get sick. I believe in healing, but I don't know. Everybody's going to die. We got this great treasure in earthen vessels. James, you don't look 18 years old. You look about 40. 20 years from now, I'll bet you'll look about 60. He's dying. His body's dying. Mine is too. One day this old flesh is going to die down. Brother, the inward man's alive. You may be stone cold, but you won't be broken. They may kill your body, but they can't kill your spirit. Jesus is with you. I can't promise you you'll never get sick. I wish people didn't get sick, but I tell you, those of you in wheelchairs, I know God can heal you, but let's don't put them down. My goodness, I've seen God work mighty miracles. I have a handicapped son. He's eight years old, can't talk, just started walking. Most beautiful image of Jesus I've ever seen. Taught me more about love than I've ever known in my life. God said over in Genesis, when he's talking to me in Exodus, when he's talking to Moses, who made the blind and the deaf and the dumb? I, God, did. Let me tell you, I don't understand it all. The devil's ravaged this world, but every precious handicapped person's just as precious in the eyes of God as every healthy person on this earth. And I believe God can heal them. I believe God can do it, but he doesn't always do it all the time. Oh, Roberts gets sick. He does. All the rest of them get sick. They may not tell about it, but they get sick. But I tell you, his presence will be with you in that hospital bed. Dear preacher, if you're laying there in the hospital bed and you're sick, God hadn't forsaken you. If you have a baby born handicapped, God isn't trying to punish you. You love the world. I mean, let's pray for the sick, but if they don't get well, let's not beat them over the head. Let's love them. Amen. Jesus said, I was sick and you visited me. You visited me. Didn't say everybody's going to be healed. Said it's appointed unto man once to die. Just as many Christians die as lost people die, we're all going to die. Let me tell you, his presence will be with you. His presence will be with you when you've lost all your money and everything else. He'll be with you. We don't need a, a, an American cultural religion. We need a Jesus. Same Jesus many of us preach. Won't, I mean, he won't cut water in East Germany and Poland. Some of your messages wouldn't ring a bell over in the middle of Africa. Some of those things you're saying won't mean a thing right down here across the border in Mexico. Brother, God will be with you always in every circumstance. Does anybody need to be saved? Any of you say, I, I don't have the presence of God in my life, but I need his presence now. I believe Jesus died on the cross, rose again, and I want him in my heart. No games or tricks or gimmicks. All over the world I preach this way and share this way, and, and I've been preaching to us believers. But some of you are saying, I've, I've never received the presence. I don't have the presence. If you need Jesus as your Savior right now, I want you to just stand up right now. Will you do that? All over the auditorium, if you need Jesus now, stand up. Some of the areas I can't see, if you see somebody stand up, point them out to me. 
Anybody want Jesus? Yes, right there. Just stand up. Anybody else? I need Jesus. I want to know his presence now. Okay, okay. Oh, okay, okay. There are people standing in many places. Those, I want just two people to stand by each person that's standing. Would you do that? This lady here, other, would two people just come and stand wherever they are around the building, just stand with them. Anybody else need to be? So let me ask you, would you turn to the person sitting by you and ask them, is the presence of Jesus Christ in your life? If they say no, would you say, would you stand up? If they say yes, just say, praise God. Okay? Let's just keep it quiet. Anybody else wanting to know? Okay? Right now, those of you that are standing, let's be quiet. Those of you that are standing, you believe Jesus died on the cross, believe He rose again, believe He's alive, He's ascended into the Father, He's the Son of God. And he said He'd be with you. Pray this prayer out loud. And those of you standing around them, pray it out loud with them. Those of you standing, pray this prayer out loud right now. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I give my life to God. I repent. Take away my sins. Save my soul. I want to live with you. Fill me with your presence. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. You are with me. You'll never leave me. And heaven is my home. Guide me in your way. In Jesus' name, amen.